As we continue to worship, I'm going to invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. If you're new to Dawson, we are walking through the Ten Commandments. We are found our way to the third commandment. I ask you a question, uh, what's in the name? What's in, what's in your name? What's, what's in a name? For every parent that names their child, there's a, a multitude of resources they might draw upon. You, you might have a, a family name that you want to pass down to the next generation You might open up God's Word and walk through biblical names that resonate with you. Uh, Certainly you look around and there are names that are popular. There are names that you you hear and maybe that's a part of the conversation. What's in a name? Three of the most memorable moments in in my life and I, I would dare say any parent's life is being in the delivery room where the nurse hands you, in my case, three boys three different times, Hayden, Luke, and Jonathan. And I remember just vividly to be able to take each of them and to hold them close and to sit next to Danielle and and to say to them, hey, Hayden, I'm your dad. To be able to look into the eyes of Jonathan, my youngest, and say, hey, Jonathan, I'm, I'm your dad. This is your Mom, to be able to hold my middle son and to say to him, Luke, I am your father. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just, I cannot help myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> Way too tempting. But you know what? We didn't ask uh, all three of our boys day one of their life. We didn't say to Hayden James or to Luke Daniel or to Jonathan Lamar, we did not say, how does this name sound to you? You comfortable with this? This fit on you pretty well? You're going to be okay going through life with this name? It, it, it is a parent's privilege and it's a parent's prerogative to name their children. And no son or daughter gets a say in that at birth. It is placed upon them by the privilege of their parents. 42 years ago, my mom and dad did not consult with me about what I would be named. David, I am because someone else chose that for me. But in absolute contrast to we who are named, we who are named by someone else, we are here to open up and to hear the word of an infinite, sovereign, almighty God. who who in contrast to each and every one of us that are here in this sanctuary, did not have a a parent fret over what he would be named. He is the one who from eternity past has been God. And his name is a name that is revealed to us. It is not bestowed upon him by us, his creation. He does not consult us as his children who are saved in his name and by his name. To say, how does this sound? No, it is revealed to us in Scripture. So we should not be surprised that the name that is above every name, where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord, that that name is to be a name that is to be honored and to be reverenced, to be consecrated and to be set apart. This, my friends, is the heart of the third commandment. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, we read it in God's word. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who will take his name in vain. Uh, Notice in Exodus chapter 20 verse 7 that this is not the first time that the name of the Lord is revealed to us and uh, finds prominence in Uh, the story of Exodus. Actually, if you would take your Bible and back up to Exodus chapter 3, you're going to find this place where the name of the Lord is revealed and its prominence is established as Moses meets God in the burning bush. And do you remember that scene in Exodus chapter 3? God is going to appear to Moses and say, go to Pharaoh and, and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. 
Well, Moses, he's got a whole back pocket of excuses and hesitations. And many of these are, are, are you know, kind of honest questions that he might have. You can see it here for yourself in chapter 13 or chapter 3, verse 13. Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me a logical question, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God, in verse 14, said to Moses, I am who I am. You can underline it, you can circle it, you can put an asterisk by it. But here we see God's name revealed to Moses and to us. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am, has sent me to you. Verse 15, God also said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name, not now, but forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all the generations. I am who I am, verse 14. The revelation of God's name. In Hebrew, it's four Hebrew consonants. In Hebrew, you do not have vowels contained in the uh, revelation. Those are added later. So there's some... Uh, controversy and conversation, maybe is a more accurate word about how do you even pronounce this? In English, you will see Y-H-W-H, those four letters, Yahweh. You will find it 6,800 times in the Bible. Given to us uh, in English, L-O-R-D, all caps, Lord. Here we have this uh, revelation of his name. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. This is the essence of Yahweh. This is the essence of his name. It's not just a designation. It's not just a, a lot of demarcation to be able to separate him from the foreign pagan gods back in Egypt. It is telling us his essence. It's telling us of his character. It's telling us of, of who this God is that is calling Moses to go back to Egypt and to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. It is the God who reveals his name. And in revealing his name, he shows us his character, his identity, who he is. My my name is David. But there's not a particular Davidness to my name. I mean, nobody would say, oh, you're David. I know exactly who you are. I know your character. I know your essence because you're David and there's a Davidness to you. Nobody goes up to to John Woods and says, hey, John, I know exactly who you are because you're a John and there's a Johnness to you. And your John nature, the essence and the character of who you are is revealed in your name. No one goes to our our executive pastor, Brad Gowan, and says, oh, you're a Brad, so I know exactly who you are because in your name uh, connotes your character and gives us an idea of the essence of who you are. Our names are important, but they don't reveal the essence of who we are. But in the Hebrew language and all throughout the Bible, you find names not just as designations, but you find names as the very essence of who a person is. That's why you always have these name changes in the Bible. You're tracking along in the book of Genesis and Sarah becomes Sarah and Abram becomes Abraham. You go through the Bible and the Old Testament, you've got Jacob becoming Israel. You've got Saul, who is a persecutor of the Christians on the Damascus Road, who is knocked off of his horse and ultimately becomes the greatest missionary and theologian the church has ever known. Well, that name Saul doesn't work anymore. He's got to become a Paul. So names give us an encounter with God sometimes in the Bible, but they also can tell us about the character of a person in the Bible. Not so much in English. Not so much for you and for me, no matter how important that name is in our family tree and our heritage, it doesn't get to the essence like Yahweh does of who God is. We are seeing his reputation. We're seeing his character. We're seeing the very essence of God. This is why when they're talking about Exodus in the Psalms, you'll read passages like you find in Psalm 106 verses 8 through 9. Yet he saved them the Israelites, out of Egypt for his, and do you see it? For his name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. He rebuked, verse 9, the Red Sea, and it became dry, and he led them through the deep as though through a desert. Does this 
getting a little bit more clear for you. Do, do you see that the whole point of Exodus is that God is going to save a people for his name's sake, for his glory. He's going to bring them to Mount Sinai. And by the time they show up at the, at the, the foot of Mount Sinai, the, the name of God is not just a designation to them. It is his reputation. It is the essence of who he is. And so they should know at this point that there's a reverence and there is a respect that goes with the very name of God. Now, you got it? You see it? Now, the question then is, what are we to do and what are we not to do with the name of God? If we see that there's a reverence and an essence of who God is revealed to us in his name, then then what is this commandment prohibiting And what is this commandment calling us to do? Go back to the passage. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. The English Standard Version gives us a translation that's very reminiscent of the old King James Version. Many of you memorize the Ten Commandments in the King James Version. And you remember, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The ESV is moving in that direction, if not really the essence of it. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Well, what does that mean? In the actual Hebrew language, one way we could translate this passage is, if we're just a wooden, one-to-one translation, you shall not lift up the name of the Lord your God for nothingness. For nothingness. So what we have in this passage is not God revealing to the Israelites that we should never use the name of God, but rather we should not misuse the name of God. We should not misuse the name of God by using it for nothingness. How could we use it for nothingness? Well, we could flippantly use it. We could profan- uh, use it in profanity. We could use it carelessly. or uh, we, could, we could have an emptiness in using the name of God. When you flip to the Old Testament, you've got two ways that you'll see again and again and again that this third commandment is broken. And there's both falsities. There's false prophets and false oaths. When you turn to the book of Jeremiah, you will see Jeremiah prophesying that the judgment of God is going to come upon the people and there will be war. And just two chapters later, after chapter 4 and chapter 6, and then four chapters later in chapter 8, you'll have false prophets that show up. And you know what they will say? Thus saith the Lord. Just like Jeremiah says, thus saith the Lord, but these false prophets are saying thus saith the Lord, but what they are saying is not from the Lord. And so you will have this whole refrain in the Old Testament of people speaking in the name of God, but they are not speaking the words of God. And so God forbids false prophecy. But also you'll find in the Old Testament that there are people that will make false oaths in business deals, in in judicial uh, measures. They, They will say, I swear upon the name of the Lord that what I am telling you is true and they are hiding under the name of the Lord, deceit and deception. So you see this when you're reading through the Old Testament. You'll see passages like Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 2, that reads, as the Lord's live, they, though they say, as the Lord lives, yet they swear falsely. And this, this is not something to be trifled with. This is not something that we just brush aside. But rather, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12 says, you shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. So the name of the Lord is the essence and character and reputation. It's not just a designation. We're not to lift it up for nothingness. We're not to profane it or use it in a false way. But how, as we see false prophecy and false oaths in the Old Testament, how in the world does this really intersect with you at work? I mean, how, how is this going to intersect with you as a parent or as a child? Or how would this intersect with you in school? I mean, does the third commandment really intersect the, the road you travel? And the answer to that is yes, yes, and yes. I want you to see three ways that this passage really intersects with your life. And I want to give you a fourth way that you're called to live this passage out in a positive way. We are called from the word of the Lord, to not misuse the name of the Lord our God out of frustration. If you open up the hymn book of the Israelites, you got 150 prayers, hymns, and one of, the, one of the refrains that you'll hear again and again is the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord. It sounds like this, Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. 
Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Or Psalm 66, sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Or Psalm 72, blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. So the name of the Lord is to be on your tongue. It is to be on your mouth. You are to utilize the name of the Lord, but it should be in adoration. It should be in prayer. It should be in in that reverent place where you're lifting your voice, calling upon the name of the Lord. And so Jesus Christ should be a name that we pray in the name of and pray to. But it should not be the name that comes out of our mouth when we're frustrated and we're traveling to work and somebody cuts us off. Jesus Christ is reserved for who we're praying to and in the name of. Oh my God should be reserved for worship and prayer. And it should not be our go-to phrases out of frustration when we're uh, aggravated with our children who won't clean their rooms. Or good Lord should be the start of a prayer. We're praying to a Lord who is good. And not when we're exasperated with our co-workers at work. God's name is to be consecrated. It's to be set apart. It's not to be an adjective that we use to to put an emphasis upon a curse word and frustration. And I I dare say that many of you who've uh, walked through the church over the decades and years would say, got it. I, I would think that many of you, as you open up God's word and you turn to the third commandment and say, I understand that there's a a prohibition to utilize in the name of the Lord out of frustration. So let's call it a day and beat the crowd to Taco Mama or something. I, know, you know, I, could, I could see how you would think that, but if we stopped here, you, you would miss the richness of this passage because it's not just that we're called not to use and misuse the name of the Lord in frustration, but we're also not called to misuse the name of the Lord for manipulation. See, the false prophets of the Old Testament, they are saying, thus saith the Lord... When what they were speaking was not from the Lord, they would use the name of the Lord to sort of bolster their words. And they had an agenda that they wanted to accomplish and they would do it, quote unquote, in the name of the Lord. And you can do that and I can do that. And this happens when we, in a phrase that I like to use, pull out the, uh, uh, the God card. What do I mean by that? We need to be careful And we need to be real clear when we say phrases like, the Lord told me to do this. We need to be careful. We need to be real clear, especially when you say, the Lord told me to tell you to do this. Years ago, I was pastoring in Tupelo, Mississippi. Ten minutes before the service, there was a gentleman I'd never seen before waltz into the service who was passing through town. He said, are you the pastor? I said, yes. I'm so glad you're here, I said. He said, I have a word from the Lord, and God has told me that I'm supposed to share it with your congregation today. I try to be kind and listen to him and hear him out. And I said, well, if you think the Lord has told you something, my friend, you've got the wrong address and maybe you're supposed to go to the Methodist church across the street. To hear so. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I told him the Presbyterian church is right next door to us right there. So. No, I tell you what I did tell him is, uh, you're thus saith the Lord. I don't sit under nor stand under as the pastor of this church. And as the shepherd of this congregation, there is no way that you're going to stand before this congregation as I've prayed through and sought the Lord throughout this week to shepherd this people through the word of God. And so you will not speak to this congregation and you will not interrupt this congregation, but I am so glad you're here and here's a pew and you can have a seat and I'd love to talk to you some more. That's not what he wanted to hear. It's an extreme example, but I I think you can understand where I'm going with this. We need to be hesitant saying to someone else, 
Thus saith the Lord, you are supposed to do this. God has told me. I have no hesitation saying to you this very morning, God speaks to me every morning. When I sit under Genesis through Revelation, God has spoken in and through his word. So when we say, God told me to tell you this, what really needs to be on our lips are are passages of Scripture, for God so loved the world. Or in view of God's mercy, Romans 12, 1. Offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve God's will for your life. It's good, pleasing, and perfect will. No hesitation. Saying the word of the Lord is the word that is revealed to us in this book. A book of God's words to us. Now, can we also say that God through the Spirit and through prayer and through worship, He speaks to us and He leads us and He comforts us and He convicts us and He challenges us? And the answer to that is yes. But in our dating relationships, when we play the God card, or in our business dealings when we play the God card, or in a church matter when we say, God told me this, it oftentimes is utilized as a trump card that shuts down any type of healthy conversation. Where do you go with that? I'll tell you what's healthy, and I think helpful, is to say, I have I've sought the Lord for His direction. I have sought for the clarity of God through his word, and to the best of my understanding, I, I'm making a decision that I desire to be pleasing to the Lord. We need to be careful that we do not blame God for our impulsive or even good-hearted decisions that we realize over the years that might have less to do with God than we might have thought in the moment. So we don't use the name of the Lord in frustration. We don't need to use the name of the Lord in manipulation. And we don't need to use the name of the Lord in deception. Again, go back to the Old Testament. You see that you have men and women who would be in these judicial proceedings and and they they would swear to the Lord and they would make a false oath. And so they were bolstering their statement by saying something that you might be tempted to say, I swear to God as you bring to a person. Hey, the book of James, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus, tells us that we're to be people that our yes is yes and our no is no. So we don't have to be people who bolster our statements by attaching it to the name of God because we need to be people that can look at people in the eyes and they know that we seek to be honest. So we don't back ourselves into a corner and put a cloak of God's name over our deception, over a falsity that we're making in that moment here. Our yes is to be yes and our no is to be no. We don't have to say everything that we think in a situation. We don't have to say everything that we feel in a situation. But we are called to strive for transparency and honesty to the best that we can. Now, do all of us fall short of this in deception, manipulation, and also in frustration? And the answer is yes. You have. You may be will in the future, all of us fall short to the holding of the third commandment in a variety of ways. And this reminds us of our sinfulness. It reminds us that we need a Savior who lived a perfect life, who died a saving death for our sins which we are all guilty of in a variety of ways. And as we walk through the Ten Commandments, it's like a mirror to our soul, showing ways that we have and are and will fall short. But praise God that we have a perfect Savior that we turn to. And as we receive His forgiveness, this third commandment is still operative for us because it leads us to pursue something. And what do we pursue Well, finally this morning, we are called to honor the name of the Lord in our adoration and our allegiance to him. Just think of the words of Jesus in Matthew's gospel when his disciples say, Lord, teach us to pray. And we have embedded there in the Lord's prayer, hallowed be thy name. 
This means we're to consecrate the name of God. We're to set apart for, for a holy purpose his name. We're to preserve it for worship and praise. When the name of the Lord is on our lips, it should be for prayer. It should be for praise. But in a sense, if we leave this morning and we think that the third commandment is just about what we don't say or what we do say, we'll misunderstand the fullness of this commandment. The Apostle Paul in this beautiful passage in Colossians, he helps us to see just the all-encompassing nature of what Exodus 20 verse 7 means for every woman and every man who's a son or daughter of the Most High God. Colossians 3 reads, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything, do you see it? In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If you're a Christian here, do you know how you became a Christian? You realized that you were a sinner. And what did you do? By faith, you called on the name of the Lord. And everyone, Romans 10, who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you have taken that next step of obedience and made your faith public through baptism, you are baptized into the family of God. How? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You, you have a cloak of identity upon you. you. You are saved by Him. You are being shaped by His name. You, you have an identity that, that is far greater than any other identity that you have professionally or personally. You are His and how you live is a reflection of, of his name to your friends and to your family members. How many of you are, are watching the uh, Winter Olympics right now? I, it's not something, I, I, it seems to me the Summer Olympics has always uh, garnered more of my attention. But, but last night I was watching a little bit of the uh, speed skating uh, events that were going on there in Beijing. I saw some of the pageantry and the celebration of the opening ceremonies. And there are 84 different countries that are there with all of these different athletes at the, at the top of their game going to compete. And they compete for gold and silver and bronze. But each of these individual group competitions ultimately reflect on who, who sent them. Their identity in the Olympics is not first and foremost as an individual, but it is whose country they represent. So as they compete, they compete in the name of their country. But it's not just when they compete. When they're in the Olympic Village and how they conduct themselves is what is a reflection upon the name of the country that they represent. When they, when they succeed and they stand on the top of the podium and they receive a gold medal or they fall short and the press interviews them, how they respond to that is ultimately a reflection upon the name of the country that sent them. And for all of us that are here, we have a far greater citizenship That there is a cloak of identity that is upon us. And whatever we do at work, whatever we do at home, whatever we do in word and deed is ultimate reflection upon the name of the Lord our God who has saved us and dwells in us. And we are a reflection to those around us as we're called to be salt and light. So I ask you, in whose name are you living? Yours or his? Whatever you do, my friends, in word or deed, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. Amen.